This is section zero of Mark Twain, a biography. The Personal and Literary Life of Samuel Langhorne Clemens by Albert Bigelow Payne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Mark Twain, a biography by Albert Bigelow Payne. Read by John Greenman. Volume One, Part One. 1835 to 1866. Introduction. To Clara Clemens Gavrilovich, who steadily upheld the author's purpose to write history rather than eulogy as the story of her father's life. An acknowledgment. Dear William Dean Howells, Joseph Hopkins Twitchell, Joseph T. Goodman, and other old friends of Mark Twain. I cannot let these volumes go to press without some grateful word to you who have helped me during the six years and more that have gone to their making. First, I want to confess how I have envied you your association with Mark Twain in those days when you and he went gypsying a long time ago. Next, I want to express my wonder at your willingness to give me so unstintedly from your precious letters and memories, when it is in the nature of man to hoard such treasures for himself and for those who follow him. And lastly, I want to tell you that I do not envy you so much any more, for in these chapters, one after another, through your grace, I have gone gypsying with you all. Neither do I wonder now, for I have come to know that out of your love for him grew that greater unselfishness or divine selfishness, as he himself might have termed it, and that nothing short of the fullest you could do for his memory would have contented your hearts. My gratitude is measureless, and it is worldwide, for there is no land so distant that it does not contain someone who has eagerly contributed to the story. Only I seem so poorly able to put my thanks into words. Albert Bigelow Payne Prefatory Note. Certain happenings as recorded in this work will be found to differ materially from the same incidents and episodes as set down in the writings of Mr. Clemens himself. Mark Twain's spirit was built of the very fabric of truth, so far as moral intent was concerned, but in his earlier autobiographical writings, and most of his earlier writings were autobiographical, he made no real pretense to accuracy of time, place, or circumstance, seeking, as he said, only to tell a good story. While in later years an ever-vivid imagination and capricious memory made history difficult, even when, as in his so-called autobiography, his effort was in the direction of fact. When I was younger, I could remember anything, whether it happened or not, he once said quaintly, but I am getting old, and soon I shall remember only the latter. The reader may be assured, where discrepancies occur, that the writer of this memoir has obtained his data from direct and positive sources, letters, diaries, account books, or other immediate memoranda, also from the concurring testimony of eyewitnesses, supported by a unity of circumstance and conditions, and not from hearsay or vagrant printed items. End of Introduction Read by John Greenman This is Section 1 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography, by Albert Bigelow Payne. Volume 1, Part 1, 1835 to 1866. Chapter 1, Ancestors. Read by John Greenman. On page 492 of the old volume of Suetonius, which Mark Twain read until his very last day, there is a reference to one Flavius Clemens, a man of wide repute, for his want of energy, and in a marginal note he has written, I guess this is where our line starts. 
it was like him to write that it spoke in his whimsical fashion the attitude of humility the ready acknowledgment of shortcoming which was his chief characteristic and made him lovable in his personality and in his work historically we need not accept this identity of the clemens ancestry the name itself has a kindly meaning and was not an uncommon one in rome there was an early pope by that name and it appears now and again in the annals of the middle ages more lately there was a gregory clemens an english landowner who became a member of parliament under cromwell and signed the death warrant of charles i afterward he was tried as a regicide his estates were confiscated and his head was exposed on a pole on the top of westminster hall tradition says that the family of gregory clemens did not remain in england but emigrated to virginia or new jersey and from them in line descended the virginia clemenses including john marshall clemens the father of mark twain perhaps the line could be traced and its various steps identified but after all an ancestor more or less need not matter when it is the story of a descendant that is to be written of mark twain's immediate forebears however there is something to be said his paternal grandfather whose name also was samuel was a man of culture and literary taste in seventeen ninety seven he married a virginia girl pamela goggin and of their five children john marshall clemens born august eleventh seventeen ninety eight was the eldest becoming male head of the family at the age of seven when his father was accidentally killed at a house raising the family was not a poor one but the boy grew up with a taste for work as a youth he became a clerk in an iron manufactory at lynchburg and doubtless studied at night at all events he acquired an education but injured his health in the meantime and somewhat later with his mother and the younger children removed to adair county kentucky where the widow presently married a sweetheart of her girlhood one simon hancock a good man in due course john clemens was sent to columbia the county seat to study law when the living heirs became of age he administered his father's estate receiving as his own share three negro slaves also a mahogany sideboard which remains among the clemens effects to this day this was in eighteen twenty one john clemens was now a young man of twenty-three never very robust but with a good profession plenty of resolution and a heart full of hope and dreams sober industrious and unswervingly upright it seemed certain that he must make his mark that he was likely to be somewhat too optimistic even visionary was not then regarded as a misfortune it was two years later that he met jane lampton whose mother was a casey a montgomery casey whose father was of the lamptons or lamptons of durham england and who on her own account was reputed to be the handsomest girl and the wittiest as well as the best dancer in all kentucky the montgomerys and the caseys of kentucky had been indian fighters in the daniel boone period and grandmother casey who had been jane montgomery had worn moccasins in her girlhood and once saved her life by jumping a fence and outrunning a redskin pursuer the montgomery and casey annals were full of blood-curdling adventures and there is to-day a casey county next to adair with a montgomery county somewhat further east as for the lamptons there is an earldom in the english family and there were claimants even then in the american branch all these things were worth while in kentucky but it was rare jane lampton herself gay buoyant celebrated for her beauty and her grace able to dance all night and all day too for that matter that won the heart of john marshall clemens swept him off his feet almost at the moment of their meeting many of the characteristics that made mark twain famous were inherited from his mother his sense of humor his prompt quaintly spoken philosophy these were distinctly her contributions to his fame speaking of her in a later day he once said she had a sort of ability which is rare in man and hardly existent in woman 
the ability to say a humorous thing with the perfect air of not knowing it to be humorous. She bequeathed him this without doubt, also her delicate complexion, her wonderful wealth of hair, her small, shapely hands and feet, and the pleasant drawling speech which gave her wit and his a serene and perfect setting. It was a one-sided love affair, the brief courtship of Jane Lampton and John Marshall Clemens. All her life Jane Clemens honored her husband, and while he lived served him loyally, but the choice of her heart had been a young physician of Lexington, with whom she had quarreled, and her prompt engagement with John Clemens was a matter of temper rather than tenderness. She stipulated that the wedding take place at once, and on May 6, 1823, they were married. She was then twenty, her husband twenty-five. More than sixty years later, when John Clemens had long been dead, she took a railway journey to a city where there was an old settlers' convention, because among the names of those attending she had noticed the name of the lover of her youth. She meant to humble herself to him and ask forgiveness after all the years. She arrived too late. The convention was over, and he was gone. Mark Twain once spoke of this and added, It is as pathetic a romance as any that has crossed the field of my personal experience in a long lifetime. End of chapter 1 Ancestors. This is section two of Mark Twain, a biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, a biography, by Albert Bigelow Payne, Volume One, Part One, 1835 to 1866, Chapter Two, The Fortunes of John and Jane Clemens, read by John Greenman. With all his ability and industry, and with the best of intentions, John Clemens would seem to have had an unerring faculty for making business mistakes. It was his optimistic outlook, no doubt, his absolute confidence in the prosperity that lay just ahead, which led him from one unfortunate locality or enterprise to another, as long as he lived. About a year after his marriage he settled with his young wife in Gainsborough, Tennessee, a mountain town on the Cumberland River, and here, in 1825, their first child, a boy, was born. They named him Orion, after the constellation, perhaps, though they changed the accent to the first syllable, calling it Orion. Gainsborough was a small place with few enough law cases, but it could hardly have been as small or furnished as few cases as the next one selected, which was Jamestown, Fentress County, still farther toward the eastward mountains. Yet Jamestown had the advantage of being brand new, and in the eye of his fancy John Clemens doubtless saw it the future metropolis of East Tennessee, with himself its foremost jurist and citizen. He took an immediate and active interest in the development of the place, established the county seat there, built the first courthouse, and was promptly elected as circuit clerk of the court. It was then that he decided to lay the foundation of a fortune for himself and his children by acquiring Fentress County land. Grants could be obtained in those days at the expense of less than a cent an acre, and John Clemens believed that the years lay not far distant when the land would increase in value ten thousand, twenty, perhaps even a hundred thousand-fold. There was no wrong estimate in that. Land covered with the finest primeval timber and filled with precious minerals, could hardly fail to become worth millions, even though his entire purchase of seventy-five thousand acres probably did not cost him more than five hundred dollars. The great tract lay about twenty-nines to the southward of Jamestown. Standing in the door of the courthouse he had built, looking out over the knob of the Cumberland Mountains toward his vast possessions, he said, "'Whatever befalls me now, my heirs are secure. I may not live to see these acres turn into silver and gold, 
but my children will. Such was the creation of that mirage of wealth, the Tennessee land, which all his days and for long afterward would lie just ahead, a golden vision, its name the single watchword of the family's fortunes, the dream fading with years, only materializing at last as a theme in a story of phantom riches, the Gilded Age. Yet for once John Clemens saw clearly, and if his dream did not come true, he was in no wise to blame. The land is priceless now, and a corporation of the Clemens heirs is today contesting the title of a thin fragment of it, about one thousand acres, overlooked in some survey. Believing the future provided for, Clemens turned his attention to present needs. He built himself a house, unusual in its style and elegance. It had two windows in each room, and its walls were covered with plastering, something which no one in Jamestown had ever seen before. He was regarded as an aristocrat. He wore a swallowtail coat of fine blue jeans, instead of the coarse brown native-made cloth. The blue jeans coat was ornamented with brass buttons and cost one dollar and twenty-five cents a yard, a high price for that locality and time. His wife wore a calico dress for company, while the neighbor wives wore homespun linsey woolsey. The new house was referred to as the Crystal Palace. When John and Jane Clemens attended balls, there were continuous balls during the holidays, they were considered the most graceful dancers. Jamestown did not become the metropolis he had dreamed. It attained almost immediately to a growth of twenty-five houses, mainly log houses, and stopped there. The country, too, was sparsely settled. Law practice was slender and unprofitable. The circuit riding from court to court was very bad for one of his physique. John Clemens saw his reserve of health and funds dwindling and decided to embark in merchandise. He built himself a store and put in a small country stock of goods. These he exchanged for ginseng, chestnuts, lamp-black, turpentine, rosin, and other produce of the country, which he took to Louisville every spring and fall in six horse wagons. In the meantime he would seem to have sold one or more of his slaves, doubtless to provide capital. There was a second baby now, a little girl, Pamela, born in September 1827. Three years later, May 1830, another little girl, Margaret, came. By this time the store and home were in one building, the store occupying one room, the household requiring two. Clearly the family's fortunes were declining. About a year after little Margaret was born, John Clemens gave up Jamestown and moved his family and stock of goods to a point nine miles distant known as the Three Forks of Wolf. The Tennessee land was safe, of course, and would be worth millions some day, but in the meantime the struggle for daily substance was becoming hard. He could not have remained at the Three Forks long, for in 1832 we find him at still another place, on the right bank of Wolf River, where a post office called Pall Mall was established, with John Clemens as postmaster, usually addressed as squire or judge. A store was run in connection with the post office. At Pall Mall in June 1832 another boy, Benjamin, was born. The family at this time occupied a log house built by John Clemens himself, the store being kept in another log house on the opposite bank of the river. He no longer practiced law. In the Gilded Age we have Mark Twain's picture of Squire Hawkins and Obedstown written from descriptions supplied in later years by his mother and his brother Orion, and while not exact in detail it is not regarded as an exaggerated presentation of East Tennessee conditions at that time. The chapter is too long and too depressing to be set down here. The reader may look it up for himself if he chooses. If he does, he will not wonder that Jane Clemens's handsome features had become somewhat sharper and her manner a shade graver with the years and burdens of marriage, or that John Clemens at thirty-six, out of health, out of tune with his environment, was rapidly getting out of heart. After all the bright promise of the beginning, things had somehow gone wrong, and hope seemed dwindling away. 
A tall man, he had become thin and unusually pale. He looked older than his years. Every spring he was prostrated with what was called sun-pain, an acute form of headache, nerve-racking and destroying to all persistent effort. Yet he did not retreat from his moral and intellectual standards, or lose the respect of that shiftless community. He was never intimidated by the rougher element, and his eyes were of a kind that would disconcert nine men out of ten. Gray and deep-set under bushy brows, they literally looked you through. Absolutely fearless, he permitted none to trample on his rights. It is told of John Clemens at Jamestown that once when he had lost a cow he handed the minister on Sunday morning a notice of the loss to be read from the pulpit, according to the custom of that community. For some reason the minister put the document aside and neglected it. At the close of the service Clemens rose and, going to the pulpit, read his announcement himself to the congregation. Those who knew Mark Twain best will not fail to recall in him certain of his father's legacies. The arrival of a letter from Colonel Sellers inviting the Hawkins family to come to Missouri is told in The Gilded Age. In reality the letter was from John Quarles, who had married Jane Clemens' sister, Patsy Lampton, and settled in Florida, Monroe County, Missouri. It was a momentous letter in The Gilded Age, and no less so in reality, for it shifted the entire scene of the Clemens family fortunes and it had to do with the birthplace and the shaping of the career of one whose memory is likely to last as long as American history. End of chapter 2 The Fortunes of John and Jane Clemens This is section 3 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne, Volume 1, Part 1, 1835 to 1866, read by John Greenman. Chapter 3 A Humble Birthplace. Florida, Missouri, was a small village in the early thirties, smaller than it is now, perhaps, though in that day it had more promise, even if less celebrity. The West was unassembled then, undigested, comparatively unknown two states louisiana and missouri with less than half a million white persons were all that lay beyond the great river st louis with its boasted ten thousand inhabitants and its river trade with the south was the single metropolis in all that vast uncharted region there was no telegraph there were no railroads no stage lines of any consequence scarcely any maps for all that one could see or guess one place was as promising as another, especially a settlement like Florida, located at the forks of a pretty stream, Salt River, which those early settlers believed might one day become navigable and carry the merchandise of that region down to the mighty Mississippi, thence to the world outside. In those days came John A. Quarles of Kentucky, with his wife, who had been Patsy Ann Lampton, also, later, Benjamin Lampton, her father, and others of the Lampton race. It was natural that they would want Jane Clemens and her husband to give up that disheartening East Tennessee venture and join them in this new and promising land. It was natural, too, for John Quarles, happy-hearted, generous, and optimistic, to write the letter. There were only twenty-one houses in Florida, but Quarles counted stables, outbuildings, everything with a roof on it, and set the number at fifty-four. Florida, with its iridescent promise and negligible future, was just the kind of place that John Clemens with unerring instinct would be certain to select, and the Quarles letter could have but one answer. Yet there would be the longing for companionship, too, and Jane Clemens must have hungered for her people. In the Gilded Age the seller's letter ends come rush hurry don't wait for anything the clemens family began immediately its preparation for getting away the store was sold and the farm the last two wagon loads of produce were sent to louisville and with the aid of the money realized a few hundred dollars john clemens and his family flitted out into the great mysterious blank 
that lay beyond the knobs of Tennessee. They had a two-horse barouche, which would seem to have been preserved out of their earlier fortunes. The barouche held the parents and the three younger children, Pamela, Margaret, and the little boy, Benjamin. There were also two extra horses, which Orion, now ten, and Jenny, the house-girl, a slave, rode. This was early in the spring of 1835. They traveled by the way of their old home at Columbia, and paid a visit to relatives. At Louisville they embarked on a steamer bound for St. Louis. Thence overland, once more through wilderness and solitude, into what was then the far west, the promised land. They arrived one evening, and if Florida was not quite all in appearance that John Clemens had dreamed, it was at least a haven with john quarles jovial hospitable and full of plans the great mississippi was less than fifty miles away salt river with a system of locks and dams would certainly become navigable to the forks with florida as its head of navigation it was a seller's fancy though perhaps it should be said here that john quarles was not the chief original of that lovely character in the gilded age that was another relative, James Lampton, a cousin, quite as lovable and a builder of even more insubstantial dreams. John Quarles was already established in merchandise in Florida, and was prospering in a small way. He had also acquired a good farm, which he worked with thirty slaves, and was probably the rich man and leading citizen of the community. He offered John Clemens a partnership in his store and agreed to aid him in the selection of some land. Furthermore, he encouraged him to renew his practice of the law. Thus far, at least, the Florida venture was not a mistake, for, whatever came, matters could not be worse than they had been in Tennessee. In a small frame building near the center of the village, John and Jane Clemens established their household. It was a humble one-story affair, with two main rooms, and a lean-to kitchen, though comfortable enough for its size, and comparatively new. It is still standing and occupied when these lines are written, and it should be preserved and guarded as a shrine for the American people, for it was here that the foremost American-born author, the man most characteristically American in every thought and word and action of his life, drew his first fluttering breath, caught blinkingly the light of a world that in years to come would rise up and in its wide realm of letters hail him as a king. It was on a bleak day, November 30th, 1835, that he entered feebly the domain he was to conquer. Long afterward one of those who knew him best said, He always seemed to me like some great being from another planet, never quite of this race or kind. He may have been, for a great comet was in the sky that year, and it would return no more until the day when he should be borne back into the far spaces of silence and undiscovered suns. But nobody thought of this then. He was a seven-month child, and there was no fanfare of welcome at his coming. Perhaps it was even suggested that, in a house so small and so sufficiently filled, there was no real need of his coming at all. One Polly Ann Buchanan, who is said to have put the first garment of any sort on him, lived to boast of the fact. This honor has been claimed also for Mrs. Millie Upton and Mrs. Damrell, probably all were present and assisted. But she had no particular pride in that matter then. It was only a puny baby with a wavering promise of life. Still, john clemens must have regarded with favor this first gift of fortune in a new land for he named the little boy samuel after his father and added the name of an old and dear virginia friend langhorn the family fortunes would seem to have been improving at this time and he may have regarded the arrival of another son as a good omen with a family of eight now including jenny the slave girl more room was badly needed and he began building without delay the result was not a mansion by any means, being still of the one-story pattern, but it was more commodious than the tiny two-room affair. The rooms were larger, and there was at least one L, or extension, for kitchen and dining-room uses. This house, completed in 1836, 
occupied by the clemens family during the remainder of the years spent in florida was often in later days pointed out as mark twain's birthplace it missed that distinction by a few months though its honor was sufficient in having sheltered his early childhood this house is no longer standing when it was torn down several years ago portions of it were carried off and manufactured into souvenirs mark twain himself disclaimed it as his birthplace and once wrote on a photograph of it no it is too stylish it is not my birthplace end of chapter three a humble birthplace read by john greenman this is section four of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne volume one part one 1835 to 1866 read by john greenman chapter four beginning a long journey it was not a robust childhood the new baby managed to go through the winter a matter of comment among the family and neighbors added strength came but slowly little sam as they called him was always delicate during those early years it was a curious childhood full of weird fantastic impressions and contradictory influences stimulating alike to the imagination and that embryo philosophy of life which begins almost with infancy john clemens seldom devoted any time to the company of his children he looked after their comfort and mental development as well as he could and gave advice on occasion he bought a book now and then sometimes a picture book and subscribed for peter parley's magazine a marvel of delight to the older children but he did not join in their amusements and he rarely or never laughed mark twain did not remember ever having seen or heard his father laugh the problem of supplying food was a somber one to john clemens also he was working on a perpetual motion machine at this period which absorbed his spare time and to the inventor at least was not a mirthful occupation jane clemens was busy too her sense of humor did not die but with added cares and years her temper as well as her features became sharper and it was just as well to be fairly out of range when she was busy with her employments little sam's companions were his brothers and sisters all older than himself orion ten years his senior followed by pamela and margaret at intervals of two and three years then by benjamin a kindly little lad whose gentle life was chiefly devoted to looking after the baby brother three years his junior but in addition to these associations there were the still more potent influences of that day and section the intimate enveloping institution of slavery the daily companionship of the slaves all the children of that time were fond of the negroes and confided in them they would in fact have been lost without such protection and company it was jenny the house girl and uncle ned a man of all work apparently acquired with the improved prospects who were in real charge of the children and supplied them with entertainment wonderful entertainment it was that was a time of visions and dreams small gossip and superstitions old tales were repeated over and over with adornments and improvements suggested by immediate events at evening the clemens children big and little gathered about the great open fireplace while jenny and uncle ned told tales and hair-lifting legends even a baby of two or three years could follow the drift of this primitive telling and would shiver and cling close with the horror and delight of its curdling thrill the tales always began with once upon a time and one of them was the story of the golden arm which the smallest listener would one day repeat more elaborately to wider audiences in many lands briefly it ran as follows once upon a time there was a man and he had a wife and she had a arm of pure gold and she died and they buried her in the graveyard and one night her husband went and dug her up and cut off her golden arm and 
took it home, and one night a ghost, all in white, come to him, and she was his wife, and she says, Where's my golden arm? Where's my golden arm? Where's my golden arm? As Uncle Ned repeated these blood-curdling questions, he would look first one and then another of his listeners in the eyes, with his hands drawn up in front of his breast, his fingers turned out and crooked like claws, while he bent with each question closer to the shrinking forms before him. The tone was sepulchral, with awful pause, as if waiting each time for a reply. The culmination came with a pounce on one of the group, a shake of the shoulders, and a shout of, "'You've got it!' And she tore him all to pieces. And the children would shout, "'Lordy!' and look furtively over their shoulder, fearing to see a woman in white against the black wall. But instead only gloomy, shapeless shadows darted across it as the flickering flames in the fireplace went out on one brand and flared up on another. Then there was a story of a great ball of fire that used to follow lonely travelers along dark roads through the woods. Once upon a time there was a man, and he was riding along the road, and he come to the haunted house, and he heard the chains rattling and rattling and rattling, and a ball of fire come rolling up and got under his stirrup. And it didn't make no difference if his horse galloped or went slow or stood still. The ball of fire stayed under his stirrup till he got plumb to the front toe, and his wife come out and say, My God, that's devil fire! And she had to work a witch spell to drive it away. How big was it, Uncle Ned? Oh, about as big as your head, and I spect it's likely to come down this here chimney most any time. Certainly an atmosphere like this meant a tropic development for the imagination of a delicate child. All the games and daily talk concerned fanciful semi-African conditions and strange primal possibilities. The children of that day believed in spells and charms and bad luck signs, all learned of their negro guardians. But if the negroes were the chief companions and protectors of the children, they were likewise one of their discomforts. The greatest real dread children knew was the fear of meeting runaway slaves. A runaway slave was regarded as worse than a wild beast, and treated worse when caught. Once the children saw one brought into Florida by six men who took him to an empty cabin, where they threw him on the floor and bound him with ropes. His groans were loud and frequent. Such things made an impression that would last a lifetime. Slave punishment, too, was not unknown, even in the household. Jenny especially was often saucy and obstreperous. Jane Clemens, with more strength of character than of body, once undertook to punish her for insolence, whereupon Jenny snatched the whip from her hand. John Clemens was sent for in haste. He came at once tied Jenny's wrists together with a bridle rein, and administered chastisements across the shoulders with a cowhide. These were things all calculated to impress a sensitive child. In pleasant weather the children roamed over the country, hunting berries and nuts, drinking sugar-water, tying knots in love-vine, picking the petals from daisies to the formula, "'Love me, love me not!' always accompanied by one or more, sometimes by half a dozen of their small, darky followers. Shoes were taken off the first of April. For a time a pair of old woolen stockings were worn, but these soon disappeared, leaving the feet bare for the summer. One of their dreads was the possibility of sticking a rusty nail into the foot, as this was liable to cause lockjaw, a malady regarded with awe and terror. They knew what lockjaw was. Uncle John Quarles' black man, Dan, was subject to it. Sometimes when he opened his mouth to its utmost capacity, he felt the joints slip and was compelled to put down the cornbread or jole and greens, or the piece of possum he was eating, while his mouth remained a fixed abyss, 
until the doctor came and restored it to a natural position by an exertion of muscular power that would have well-nigh lifted an ox. Uncle John Quarles, his home, his farm, his slaves, all were sources of never-ending delight. Perhaps the farm was just an ordinary Missouri farm, and the slaves just average negroes, but to those children these things were never apparent. There was a halo about anything that belonged to Uncle John Quarles, and that halo was the jovial, hilarious kindness of that gentle-hearted, humane man. To visit at his house was for a child to be in a heaven of mirth and pranks continually. When the children came for eggs, he would say, "'Your hens won't lay, eh? Uh, tell your ma to feed em, parch corn, and drive em uphill.' And this was always a splendid stroke of humor to his small hearers. Also he knew how to mimic with his empty hands the peculiar patting and tossing of a pone of cornbread before placing it in the oven. He would make the most fearful threats to his own children for disobedience, but never executed any of them. When they were out fishing and returned late, he would say, "'You, if I have to hunt you again after dark, I will make you smell like a burnt horn.' Nothing could exceed the ferocity of this threat, and all the children with delightful terror and curiosity wondered what would happen, if it ever did happen, that would result in giving a child that peculiar savor. Altogether it was a curious early childhood that little Sam had, at least it seems so to us now. Doubtless it was commonplace enough for that time and locality. End of chapter 4 Beginning a Long Journey Read by John Greenman This is section five of Mark Twain, a biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, a biography. Volume one, part one, 1835 to 1866. Chapter five, The Way of Fortune. Read by John Greenman. Perhaps John Quarles' jocular, happy-go-lucky nature and general conduct did not altogether harmonize with John Clemens' more taciturn business methods notwithstanding the fact that he was a builder of dreams clemens was neat and methodical with his papers always in order he had a hearty dislike for anything resembling frivolity and confusion which very likely were the chief features of john quarles storekeeping at all events they dissolved partnership at the end of two or three years and clemens opened business for himself across the street he also practiced law whenever there were cases and was elected justice of the peace, acquiring the permanent title of judge. He needed someone to assist in the store, and took Orion, who was by this time twelve or thirteen years old. But besides his youth, Orion, all his days a visionary, was a studious, pensive lad with no taste for commerce. Then a partnership was formed with a man who developed neither capital nor business ability, and proved a disaster in the end. The modest tide of success which had come with John Clemens' establishment at Florida had begun to wane. Another boy, Henry, born in July 1838, added one more responsibility to his burdens. There still remained a promise of better things. There seemed at least a good prospect that the scheme for making Salt River navigable was likely to become operative. With even small boats, bateaux, running as high as the lower branch of the south fork florida would become an emporium of trade and merchants and property owners of that village would reap a harvest an act of the legislature was passed incorporating the navigation company with judge clemens as its president congress was petitioned to aid this work of internal improvement so confident was the company of success that the hamlet was thrown into a fever of excitement by the establishment of a boat-yard and the actual construction of a bateau but a democratic congress turned its back on the proposed improvement no boat bigger than a skiff ever ascended salt river though there was a wild report evidently a hoax that a party of picnickers had seen one night a ghostly steamer loaded and manned puffing up the stream an old Scotchman, Hugh Robinson, when he heard of it, said, "'I don't doubt a word they say. 
in scotland it often happens that when people have been killed or are troubled they send their spirits abroad and they are seen as much like themselves as a reflection in a looking-glass that was a ghost of some wrecked steamboat but john quarles who was present laughed <laughs> if ever anybody was in trouble the men on that steamboat were he said they were the democratic candidates at the last election they killed salt river improvements and salt river has killed them their ghosts went up the river on a ghostly steamboat it is possible that this comment which was widely repeated and traveled far was the origin of the term going up salt river as applied to defeated political candidates the dictionaries give this phrase as probably traceable to a small difficult stream in kentucky but it seems more reasonable to believe that it originated in quarles witty comment no other attempt was ever made to establish navigation on salt river rumors of railroads already running in the east put an end to any such thought railroads could run anywhere and were probably cheaper and easier to maintain than the difficult navigation requiring locks and dams salt river lost its prestige as a possible water highway and became mere scenery railroads have ruined greater rivers than the little salt and greater villages than florida though neither florida nor salt river has been touched by a railroad to this day perhaps such close detail of early history may be thought unnecessary in a work of this kind but all these things were definite influences in the career of the little lad whom the world would one day know as mark twain end of chapter five the way of fortune read by john greenman this is section six of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne volume one part one eighteen thirty five to eighteen sixty six chapter six a new home read by john greenman the death of little margaret was the final misfortune that came to the clemens family in florida doubtless it hastened their departure there was a superstition in those days that to refer to health as good luck rather than to ascribe it to the kindness of providence was to bring about a judgment jane clemens one day spoke to a neighbor of their good luck in thus far having lost no member of their family that same day when the sisters pamela and margaret returned from school margaret laid her books on the table looked in the glass at her flushed cheeks pulled out the trundle bed and lay down she was never in her right mind again the doctor was sent for and diagnosed the case bilious fever one evening about nine o'clock orion was sitting on the edge of the trundle bed by the patient when the door opened and little sam then about four years old walked in from his bedroom fast asleep he came to the side of the trundle bed and pulled at the bedding near margaret's shoulder for some time before he woke next day the little girl was picking at the coverlet and it was known that she could not live about a week later she died she was nine years old a beautiful child plump in form with rosy cheeks black hair and bright eyes this was in august eighteen thirty nine it was little sam's first sight of death the first break in the clemens family it left a sad household the shoemaker who lived next door claimed to have seen several weeks previous in a vision the coffin and the funeral procession pass the gate by the winding road to the cemetery exactly as it happened matters were now going badly enough with john clemens yet he never was without one great comforting thought the future of the tennessee land it underlaid every plan it was an anodyne for every ill when we sell the tennessee land everything will be all right was the refrain that brought solace in the darkest hours a blessing for him that this was so for he had little else to brighten his days negotiations looking to the sale of the land were usually in progress when the pressure became very hard and finances were at their lowest ebb 
It was offered at any price, at five cents an acre sometimes. When conditions improved, however little, the price suddenly advanced even to its maximum of one thousand dollars an acre. Now and then a genuine offer came along, but though eagerly welcomed at the moment, it was always refused after a little consideration. "'We will struggle along somehow, Jane,' he would say. "'We will not throw away the children's fortune.' There was one other who believed in the Tennessee land, Jane Clemens's favorite cousin, James Lampton, the courtliest, gentlest, most prodigal optimist of all that guileless race. To James Lampton the land always had millions in it. Everything had. He made stupendous fortunes daily, in new ways. The bare mention of the Tennessee land sent him off into figures that ended with the purchase of estates in England adjoining those of the Durham Lamptons, whom he always referred to as our kindred, casually mentioning the whereabouts and health of the present earl. Mark Twain merely put James Lampton on paper when he created Colonel Sellers, and the story of the Hawkins family as told in The Gilded Age reflects clearly the struggle of those days. The words Tennessee land, with their golden promise, became his earliest remembered syllables. He grew to detest them in time, for they came to mean mockery. One of the offers received was the trifling sum of two hundred and fifty dollars, and such was the moment's need that even this was considered. Then, of course, it was scornfully refused. In some autobiographical chapters which Orion Clemens left behind, he said, if we had received that two hundred and fifty dollars, it would have been more than we ever made, clear of expenses, out of the whole of the Tennessee land, after forty years of worry, to three generations. What a less speculative and more logical reasoner would have done in the beginning, John Clemens did now. He selected a place which, though little more than a village, was on a river already navigable, a steamboat town, with at least the beginnings of manufacturing and trade already established, that is to say, Hannibal, Missouri, a point well chosen, as shown by its prosperity today. He did not delay matters. When he came to a decision, he acted quickly. He disposed of a portion of his goods and shipped the remainder overland. Then, with his family and chattels loaded in a wagon, he was ready to set out for the new home. Orion records that, for some reason his father did not invite him to get into the wagon, and how, being always sensitive to slight, he had regarded this in the light of deliberate desertion. The sense of abandonment caused my heart to ache. The wagon had gone a few feet when I was discovered and invited to enter. How I wished they had not missed me until they had arrived at Hannibal! Then the world would have seen how I was treated, and would have cried, Shame! This incident, noted and remembered, long after became curiously confused with another in Mark Twain's mind. In an autobiographical chapter published in the North American Review, he tells of the move to Hannibal and relates that he himself was left behind by his absent-minded family. The incident of his own abandonment did not happen then, but later, and somewhat differently. It would indeed be an absent-minded family if the parents, and the sister and brothers ranging up to fourteen years of age, should drive off leaving little Sam, age four, behind. As mentioned in the prefatory note, Mark Twain's memory played him many tricks in later life. Incidents were filtered through his vivid imagination until many of them bore little relation to the actual occurrence. Some of these lapses were only amusing, but occasionally they worked an unintentional injustice. It is the author's purpose in every instance, so far as possible, to keep the record straight. End of chapter 6 A New Home Read by John Greenman This is section 7 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography, by Albert Bigelow Payne. Volume 1, Part 1, 1835 to 1866. Chapter 7 The Little Town of Hannibal. Read by John Greenman. 
Hannibal, in 1839, was already a corporate community, and had an atmosphere of its own. It was a town with a distinct southern flavor, though rather more astir than the true southern community of that period, more western in that it planned, though without excitement, certain new enterprises, and made a show, at least, of manufacturing. It was some Noland, a slave town could not be less than that, but it was not wholly asleep, that is to say, dead, and it was tranquilly content. Mark Twain remembered it as the white town drowsing in the sunshine of a summer morning, the great Mississippi, the magnificent Mississippi, rolling its mile-wide tide along the dense forest away on the other side the little city was proud of its scenery and justly so circled with bluffs with holiday's hill on the north lover's leap on the south the shining river in the foreground there was little to be desired in the way of setting the river of course was the great highway rafts drifted by steamboats passed up and down and gave communication to the outside world st louis the metropolis was only one hundred miles away hannibal was inclined to rank itself as of next importance and took on airs accordingly it had society too all kinds from the negroes and the town drunkards general gaines and jimmy finn later old ben blankenship up through several nondescript grades of mechanics and tradesmen to the professional men of the community who wore tall hats ruffled shirt-fronts and swallow-tail coats usually of some positive color blue snuff-brown and green these and their families constituted the true aristocracy of the southern town most of them had pleasant homes brick or large frame mansions with colonnaded entrances after the manner of all southern architecture of that period which had an undoubted greek root because of certain drawing-books it is said accessible to the builders of those days most of them also had means slaves and land which yielded an income in addition to their professional earnings they lived in such style as was considered fitting to their rank and had such comforts as were then obtainable it was to this grade of society that judge clemens and his family belonged but his means no longer enabled him to provide either the comforts or the ostentation of his class he settled his family and belongings in a portion of a house on hill street the pavey hotel his merchandise he established modestly on main street with orion in a new suit of clothes as clerk possibly the clothes gave orion a renewed ambition for mercantile life but this waned business did not begin actively and he was presently dreaming and reading away the time a little later he became a printer's apprentice in the office of the hannibal journal at his father's suggestion orion clemens perhaps deserves a special word here he was to be much associated with his more famous brother for many years and his personality as boy and man is worth at least a casual consideration he was fifteen now and had developed characteristics which in a greater or lesser degree were to go with him through life of a kindly loving disposition like all of the clemens children quick of temper but always contrite or forgiving he was never without the fond regard of those who knew him best his weaknesses were manifold but on the whole of a negative kind honorable and truthful he had no tendency to bad habits or unworthy pursuits indeed he had no positive traits of any sort that was his chief misfortune full of whims and fancies unstable indeterminate he was swayed by every passing emotion and influence daily he laid out a new course of study and achievement only to fling it aside because of some chance remark or printed paragraph or bit of advice that ran contrary to his purpose such a life is bound to be a succession of extremes alternate periods of supreme exaltation and despair in his autobiographical chapters already mentioned 
orion sets down every impulse and emotion and failure with that faithful humility which won him always the respect if not always the approval of men printing was a step downward for it was a trade and orion felt it keenly a gentleman's son and a prospective heir of the tennessee land he was entitled to a profession to him it was punishment and the disgrace weighed upon him then he remembered that benjamin franklin had been a printer and had eaten only an apple and a bunch of grapes for his dinner orion decided to emulate franklin and for a time he took only a biscuit and a glass of water at a meal foreseeing the day when he should electrify the world with his eloquence he was surprised to find how clear his mind was on this low diet and how rapidly he learned his trade of the other children pamela now twelve and benjamin seven were put to school they were pretty attractive children and henry the baby was a sturdy toddler the pride of the household little sam was the least promising of the flock he remained delicate and developed little beyond a tendency to pranks he was a queer fanciful uncommunicative child that detested indoors and would run away if not watched always in the direction of the river he walked in his sleep too and often the rest of the household got up in the middle of the night to find him fretting with cold in some dark corner the doctor was summoned for him oftener than was good for the family purse or for him perhaps if we may credit the story of heavy dosings of those stern allopathic days yet he would appear not to have been satisfied with his heritage of ailments and was ambitious for more an epidemic of measles the black deadly kind was ravaging hannibal and he yearned for the complaint he yearned so much that when he heard of a playmate one of the bowen boys who had it he ran away and slipping into the house crept into bed with the infection the success of this venture was complete some days later the clemens family gathered tearfully around little sam's bed to see him die according to his own after confession this gratified him and he was willing to die for the glory of that touching scene however he disappointed them and was presently up and about in search of fresh laurels in later life mr clemens did not recollect the precise period of this illness with habitual indifference he assigned it to various years as his mood or the exigencies of his theme required without doubt the measles incident occurred when he was very young he must have been a wearing child and we may believe that jane clemens with her varied cares and labors did not always find him a comfort you gave me more uneasiness than any child i had she said to him once in her old age i suppose you were afraid i wouldn't live he suggested in his tranquil fashion she looked at him with that keen humor that had not dulled in eighty years no afraid you would she said but that was only her joke for she was the most tender-hearted creature in the world and like mothers in general had a weakness for the child that demanded most of her mother's care it was mainly on his account that she spent her summers on john quarles farm near florida and it was during the first summer that an incident already mentioned occurred it was decided that the whole family should go for a brief visit and on one saturday morning in june mrs clemens with the three elder children and the baby accompanied by jenny the slave girl set out in a light wagon for the day's drive leaving judge clemens to bring little sam on horseback sunday morning the hour was early when judge clemens got up to saddle his horse and little sam was still asleep the horse being ready clemens his mind far away mounted and rode off without once remembering the little boy and in the course of the afternoon arrived at his brother-in-law's farm then he was confronted by jane clemens who demanded little sam why said the judge aghast i never once thought of him after i left him asleep wharton lampton a brother of jane clemens and patsy quarles hastily saddled a horse and set out helter-skelter for hannibal 
he arrived in the early dusk the child was safe enough but he was crying with loneliness and hunger he had spent most of the day in the locked deserted house playing with a hole in the meal sack where the meal ran out when properly encouraged in a tiny stream he was fed and comforted and next day was safe on the farm which during that summer and those that followed it became so large a part of his boyhood and lent a coloring to his later years end of chapter seven the little town of hannibal read by john greenman this is section eight of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne volume one part one eighteen thirty five to eighteen sixty six chapter eight the farm read by john greenman we have already mentioned the delight of the clemens children in uncle john quarles farm to little sam it was probably a life-saver with his small cousin tabitha tabitha quarles now mrs greening of palmyra missouri has supplied most of the material for this chapter just his own age they called her puss he wandered over that magic domain fording new marvels at every step new delights everywhere a slave girl mary usually attended them but she was only six years older and not older at all in reality so she was just a playmate and not a guardian to be feared or evaded sometimes indeed it was necessary for her to threaten to tell miss patsy or miss jane when her little charges insisted on going farther or staying later than she thought wise from the viewpoint of her own personal safety but this was seldom and on the whole a stay at the farm was just one long idyllic dream of summer time and freedom the farmhouse stood in the middle of a large yard entered by a stile made of sawed-off logs of graduated heights in the corner of the yard were hickory trees and black walnut and beyond the fence the hill fell away past the barns the corn cribs and the tobacco house to a brook a divine place to wade with deep dark forbidden pools down in the pasture there were swings under the big trees and mary swung the children and ran under them until their feet touched the branches and then took her turn and balanced herself so high that their one wish was to be as old as mary and swing in that splendid way all the woods were full of squirrels gray squirrels and red fox species and many birds and flowers all the meadows were gay with clover and butterflies and musical with singing grasshoppers and calling larks there were blackberries in the fence rows apples and peaches in the orchard and watermelons in the corn they were not always ripe those watermelons and once when little sam had eaten several pieces of a green one he was seized with cramps so severe that most of the household expected him to die forthwith jane clemens was not heavily concerned sammy will pull through she said he wasn't born to die that way it is the slender constitution that bears the strain sammy did pull through and in a brief time was ready for fresh adventure there were plenty of these there were the horses to ride to and from the fields the ox-wagons to ride in when they had dumped their heavy loads the circular horsepower to ride on when they threshed the wheat this last was a dangerous and forbidden pleasure but the children would dart between the teams and climb on and the slave who was driving would pretend not to see then in the evening when the black woman came along going after the cows the children would race ahead and set the cows running and jingling their bells especially little sam for he was a wild-headed impetuous child of sudden ecstasies that sent him capering and swinging his arms venting his emotions in a series of leaps and shrieks and somersaults and spasms of laughter as he lay rolling in the grass his tendency to mischief grew with this wide liberty improved health and the encouragement of john quarles good-natured fun-loving slaves the negro quarters beyond the orchard were especially attractive 
in one cabin lived a bedridden white-headed old woman whom the children visited daily and looked upon with awe for she was said to be a thousand years old and to have talked with moses the negroes believed this the children too of course and that she had lost her health in the desert coming out of egypt the bald spot on her head was caused by fright at seeing pharaoh drowned she also knew how to avert spells and ward off witches which added greatly to her prestige uncle dan'l was a favorite too kind-hearted and dependable while his occasional lockjaw gave him an unusual distinction long afterward he would become nigger jim in the tom sawyer and huckleberry finn tales and so in his gentle guilelessness win immortality and the love of many men certainly this was a heavenly place for a little boy the farm of uncle john quarles and the house was as wonderful as its surroundings it was a two-story double log building with a spacious floor roofed in connecting the two divisions in the summer the table was set in the middle of that shady breezy pavilion and sumptuous meals were served in the lavish southern style brought to the table in vast dishes that left only room for rows of plates around the edge fried chicken roast pig turkeys ducks geese venison just killed squirrels rabbits partridges pheasants prairie chickens the list is too long to be served here if a little boy could not improve on that bill of fare and in that atmosphere his case was hopeless indeed his mother kept him there until the late fall when the chilly evenings made them gather around the wide blazing fireplace sixty years later he wrote of that scene i can see the room yet with perfect clearness i can see all its buildings all its details the family room of the house with a trundle bed in one corner and the spinning wheel in another a wheel whose rising and falling wail heard from a distance was the mournfulest of all sounds to me and made me homesick and low-spirited and filled my atmosphere with the wandering spirits of the dead the vast fireplace piled high with flaming logs from whose ends a sugary sap bubbled out but did not go to waste for we scraped it off and ate it the lazy cat spread out on the rough hearth stones the drowsy dogs braced against the jams blinking my aunt in one chimney corner and my uncle in the other smoking his corn-cob pipe the slick and carpetless oak floor faintly mirroring the flame tongues and freckled with black indentations where fire coals had popped out and died a leisurely death half a dozen children romping in the background twilight splint bottom chairs here and there some with rockers a cradle out of service but waiting with confidence one is tempted to dwell on this period to quote prodigally from these vivid memories the thousand-minute impressions which the child's sensitive mind acquired in that long-ago time and would reveal everywhere in his work in the years to come for him it was education of a more valuable and lasting sort than any he would ever acquire from books End of chapter 8 The Farm Read by John Greenman This is section 9 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne Volume 1, Part 1, 1835 to 1866 Chapter 9, School Days Read by John Greenman 
nevertheless on his return to hannibal it was decided that little sam was now ready to go to school he was about five years old and the months on the farm had left him wiry and lively even if not very robust his mother declared that he gave her more trouble than all the other children put together he drives me crazy with his didos when he is in the house she used to say and when he is out of it i am expecting every minute that some one will bring him home half dead he did in fact achieve the first of his nine narrow escapes from drowning about this time and was pulled out of the river one afternoon and brought home in a limp and unpromising condition when with mullen tea and castor oil she had restored him to activity she said i guess there wasn't much danger people born to be hanged are safe in water she declared she was willing to pay somebody to take him off her hands for a part of each day and try to teach him manners perhaps this is a good place to say that jane clemens was the original of tom sawyer's aunt polly and her portrait as presented in that book is considered perfect kind-hearted fearless looking and acting ten years older than her age as women did in that time always outspoken and sometimes severe she was regarded as a character by her friends and beloved by them as a charitable sympathetic woman whom it was good to know her sense of pity was abnormal she refused to kill even flies and punished the cat for catching mice she would drown the young kittens when necessary but warmed the water for the purpose on coming to hannibal she joined the presbyterian church and her religion was of that clean-cut strenuous kind which regards as necessary institutions hell and satan though she had been known to express pity for the latter for being obliged to surround himself with such poor society her children she directed with considerable firmness and all were tractable and growing in grace except little sam even baby henry at two was lisping the prayers that sam would let go by default unless carefully guarded his sister pamela who was eight years older and always loved him dearly usually supervised these spiritual exercises and in her gentle care earned immortality as the cousin mary of tom sawyer he would say his prayers willingly enough when encouraged by his sister pamela but he much preferred to sit up in bed and tell astonishing tales of the day's adventure tales which made prayer seem a futile corrective and caused his listeners to wonder why the lightning was restrained so long they did not know they were glimpsing the first outcroppings of a genius that would one day amaze and entertain the nations neighbors hearing of these things also certain of his narrations remonstrated with mrs clemens you don't believe anything that child says i hope oh yes i know his average i discount him ninety per cent the rest is pure gold at another time she said sammy is a well of truth but you can't bring it all up in one bucket this however is digression the incidents may have happened somewhat later a certain miss e hoar was selected to receive the payment for taking charge of little sam during several hours each day directing him mentally and morally in the meantime her school was then in a log house on main street later it was removed to third street and was of the primitive old-fashioned kind with pupils of all ages ranging in advancement from the primer to the third reader from the tables to long division with a little geography and grammar and a good deal of spelling long division and the third reader completed the curriculum in that school pupils who decided to take a postgraduate course went to a mr cross who taught in a frame house on the hill facing what is now the public square miss hoar received twenty-five cents a week for each pupil and opened her school with prayer after which came a chapter of the bible with explanations and the rules of conduct then the a b c class was called because their recital was a hand-to-hand -hand struggle requiring no preparation the rules of conduct that first day interested little sam 
he calculated how much he would need to trim in to sail close to the danger line and still avoid disaster he made a miscalculation during the forenoon and received warning a second offense would mean punishment he did not mean to be caught the second time but he had not learned miss hoar yet and was presently startled by being commanded to go out and bring a stick for his own correction this was certainly disturbing it was sudden and then he did not know much about the selection of sticks jane clemens had usually used her hand it required a second command to get him headed in the right direction and he was a trifle dazed when he got outside he had the forests of missouri to select from but choice was difficult everything looked too big and competent even the smallest switch had a wiry discouraging look across the way was a cooper shop with a good many shavings outside one had blown across and lay just in front of him it was an inspiration he picked it up and solemnly entering the schoolroom meekly handed it to miss hoar perhaps miss hoar's sense of humor prompted forgiveness but discipline must be maintained samuel langhorne clemens she said he had never heard it all strung together in that ominous way i am ashamed of you jimmy dunlap go and bring a switch for sammy and jimmy dunlap went and the switch was of a sort to give the little boy an immediate and permanent distaste for school he informed his mother when he went home at noon that he did not care for school that he had no desire to be a great man that he preferred to be a pirate or an indian and scalp or drown such people as miss hoar down in her heart his mother was sorry for him but what she said was that she was glad there was somebody at last who could take him in hand he returned to school but he never learned to like it each morning he went with reluctance and remained with loathing the loathing which he always had for anything resembling bondage and tyranny or even the smallest curtailment of liberty a school was ruled with a rod in those days a busy and efficient rod as the scripture recommended of the smaller boys little sam's back was sore as often as the next and he dreamed mainly of a day when grown big and fierce he would descend with his band and capture miss hoar and probably drag her by the hair as he had seen indians and pirates do in the pictures when the days of early summer came again when from his desk he could see the sunshine lighting the soft green of holiday's hill with the purple distance beyond and the glint of the river it seemed to him that to be shut up with a webster's spelling-book and a cross old maid was more than human nature could bear among the records preserved from that far-off day there remains a yellow slip whereon in neat old-fashioned penmanship is inscribed miss pamela clemens has won the love of her teacher and schoolmates by her amiable deportment and faithful application to her various studies e hoar teacher if any such testimonial was ever awarded to little sam diligent search has failed to reveal it if he won the love of his teacher and playmates it was probably for other reasons yet he must have learned somehow for he could read presently and was soon regarded as a good speller for his years his spelling came as a natural gift as did most of his attainments then and later it has already been mentioned that miss hoar opened her school with prayer and scriptural readings little sam did not especially delight in these things but he respected them not to do so was dangerous flames were being kept brisk for little boys who were heedless of sacred matters his home teaching convinced him of that he also respected miss hoar as an example of orthodox faith and when she read the text ask and ye shall receive and assured them that whoever prayed for a thing earnestly his prayer would be answered he believed it a small schoolmate the baker's daughter brought gingerbread to school every morning and little sam was just honing for some of it he wanted a piece of that baker's gingerbread more than anything else in the world and he decided to pray for it the little girl sat in front of him 
but always until that morning had kept the gingerbread out of sight. Now, however, when he finished his prayer and looked up, a small morsel of the precious food lay in front of him. Perhaps the little girl could no longer stand that hungry look in his eyes. Possibly she had heard his petition. At all events, his prayer bore fruit, and his faith at that moment would have moved Holliday's Hill. He decided to pray for everything he wanted, but when he tried the gingerbread supplication next morning, it had no result. Grieved but still unshaken, he tried next morning again. Still no gingerbread. And when a third and fourth effort left him hungry, he grew despairing and silent, and wore the haggard face of doubt. His mother said, "'What's the matter, Sammy? Are you sick?' "'No,' he said. "'But I don't believe in saying prayers any more, and I'm never going to do it again.' "'Why, Sammy, what in the world has happened?' she asked anxiously. Then he broke down and cried on her lap and told her, for it was a serious thing in that day openly to repudiate faith. Jane Clemens gathered him to her heart and comforted him. "'I'll make you a whole pan of gingerbread, better than that,' she said. "'And the school will soon be out, too, and you can go back to Uncle John's farm.' And so passed and ended Little Sam's first school days. End of chapter 9 School Days Read by John Greenman This is section 10 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne. Volume 1, Part 1, 1835 to 1866. Chapter 10 Early Vicissitude and Sorrow. Read by John Greenman. Prosperity came laggingly enough to the Clemens household. The year 1840 brought hard times. The business venture paid little or no return. Law practice was not much more remunerative. Judge Clemens ran for the office of Justice of the Peace and was elected, but fees were neither large nor frequent. By the end of the year it became necessary to part with Jenny, the slave girl, a grief to all of them, for they were fond of her in spite of her willfulness, and she regarded them as her family. She was tall, well-formed, nearly black, and brought a good price. A Methodist minister in Hannibal sold a negro child at the same time to another minister who took it to his home farther south. As the steamboat moved away from the landing, the child's mother stood at the water's edge, shrieking her anguish. We are prone to consider these things harshly now, when slavery has been dead for nearly half a century. But it was a sacred institution then, and to sell a child from its mother was little more than to sell today a calf from its lowing dam. One could be sorry, of course, in both instances, but necessity or convenience are matters usually considered before sentiment. Mark Twain once said of his mother, "'Kind-hearted and compassionate as she was, I think she was not conscious that slavery was a bald, grotesque, and unwarranted usurpation. She had never heard it assailed in any pulpit, but had heard it defended and sanctified in a thousand. As far as her experience went, the wise, the good, and the holy were unanimous in the belief that slavery was right righteous, sacred, the peculiar pet of the deity, and a condition which the slave himself ought to be daily and nightly thankful for. Yet Jane Clemens must have had qualms at times, vague, unassembled doubts that troubled her spirit. After Jenny was gone a little black chore-boy was hired from his owner, who had bought him on the east shore of Maryland, and brought him to that remote western village far from family and friends. He was a cheery spirit in spite of that, and gentle, but very noisy. All day he went about singing, 
whistling and whooping until his noise became monotonous, maddening. One day little Sam said, Ma, that was the southern term, make Sandy stop singing all the time, it's awful. Tears suddenly came into his mother's eyes. Poor thing, he is sold away from his home. When he sings it shows maybe he is not remembering. When he's still, I am afraid he is thinking, and I can't bear it. Yet anyone in that day who advanced the idea of freeing the slaves was held in abhorrence. An abolitionist was something to despise, to stone out of the community. The children held the name in horror as belonging to something less than human, something with claws, perhaps, and a tail. The money received for the sale of Jenny made Judge Clemens easier for a time. Business appears to have improved, too, and he was tided through another year, during which he seems to have made payments on an expensive piece of real estate on Hill and Main Streets. This property acquired in November 1839 meant the payment of some seven thousand dollars, and was a credit purchase, beyond doubt. It was well rented, but the tenants did not always pay, and presently a crisis came, a descent of creditors, and John Clemens at forty-four found himself without business and without means. He offered everything, his cow, his household furniture, even his forks and spoons, to his creditors, who protested that he must not strip himself. They assured him that they admired his integrity so much they would aid him to resume business. But when he went to St. Louis to lay in a stock of goods, he was coldly met, and the venture came to nothing. He now made a trip to Tennessee in the hope of collecting some old debts and to raise money on the Tennessee land. He took along a negro man named Charlie, whom he probably picked up for a small sum, hoping to make something through his disposal in a better market. The trip was another failure. The man who owed him a considerable sum of money was solvent, but pleaded hard times. It seems so very hard upon him, John Clemens wrote home, to pay such a sum that I could not have the conscience to hold him to it. I still have Charlie. The highest price I had offered for him in New Orleans was fifty dollars, in Vicksburg forty dollars. After performing the journey to Tennessee, I expect to sell him for whatever he will bring. I do not know what I can commence for a business in the spring. My brain is constantly on the rack with the study, and I can't relieve myself of it. The future, taking its completion from the state of my health or mind, is alternately beaming in sunshine or overshadowed with clouds, but mostly cloudy, as you may suppose. I want bodily exercise, some constant and active employment, in the first place, and in the next place I want to be paid for it, if possible. This letter is dated January 7, 1842. He returned without any financial success, and obtained employment for a time in a commission house on the levee. The proprietor found some fault one day, and Judge Clemens walked out of the premises. On his way home he stopped in a general store, kept by a man named Selms, to make some purchases. When he asked that these be placed on account, Selms hesitated. Judge Clemens laid down a five-dollar gold piece, the last money he possessed in the world, took the goods, and never entered the place again. When Jane Clemens reproached him for having made the trip to Tennessee at a cost of two hundred dollars, so badly needed at this time, he only replied gently that he had gone for what he believed to be the best. "'I am not able to dig in the streets,' he added, and Orion, who records this, adds, "'I can see yet the hopeless expression of his face.'" During a former period of depression such as this, death had come into the Clemens home. It came again now. Little Benjamin, a sensitive, amiable boy of ten, one day sickened, and died within a week, May 12, 1842. He was a favorite child, and his death was a terrible blow. Little Sam long remembered the picture of his parents' grief, and Orion recalls that they kissed each other, something hitherto unknown. 
Judge Clemens went back to his law and judicial practice. Mrs. Clemens decided to take a few boarders. Orion, by this time seventeen and a very good journeyman printer, obtained a place in St. Louis to aid in the family support. The tide of fortune having touched low water mark, the usual gentle stage of improvement set in. Times grew better in Hannibal after those first two or three years. Legal fees became larger and more frequent. Within another two years, Judge Clemens appears to have been in fairly hopeful circumstances again, able at least to invest some money in silkworm culture and lose it, also to buy a piano for Pamela, and to build a modest house on the Hill Street property, which a rich St. Louis cousin, James Clemens, had preserved for him. It was the house which is known today as the Mark Twain home. This house, in 1911, was bought by Mr. and Mrs. George A. Mahan, and presented to Hannibal for a memorial museum. Near it, toward the corner of Main Street, was his office, and here he dispensed law and justice in a manner which, if it did not bring him affluence, at least won for him the respect of the entire community. One example will serve. Next to his office was a stonecutter's shop. One day the proprietor, Dave Atkinson, got into a muss with one fighting MacDonald, and there was a tremendous racket. Judge Clemens ran out and found the men down, punishing each other on the pavement. "'I command the peace!' he shouted, as he came up to them. No one paid the least attention. "'I command the peace!' he shouted again, still louder, but with no result. A stone-cutter's mallet lay there, handy. Judge Clemens seized it, and, leaning over the combatants, gave the upper one, MacDonald, a smart blow on the head. "'I command the peace!' he said for the third time, and struck a considerable smarter blow. That settled it. The second blow was of the sort that made MacDonald roll over, and peace ensued. Judge Clemens hailed both men into his court, fined them, and collected his fee. Such enterprise in the cause of justice deserved prompt reward. End of chapter 10 Early Vicissitude and Sorrow Read by John Greenman This is section 11 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne Volume 1, Part 1 1835 to 1866. Chapter 11. Days of Education. Read by John Greenman. The Clemens family had made one or two moves since its arrival in Hannibal, but the identity of these temporary residences and the period of occupation of each can no longer be established. Mark Twain once said, In 1843, my father caught me in a lie. It is not this fact that gives me the date, but the house we lived in. We were there only a year. We may believe it was the active result of that lie that fixed his memory of the place, for his father seldom punished him. When he did, it was a thorough and satisfactory performance. It was about the period of moving into the new house, 1844, that the Tom Sawyer days, that is to say, the boyhood of Samuel Clemens, may be said to have begun. Up to that time he was just little Sam, a child, wild and mischievous, often exasperating, but still a child, a delicate little lad to be worried over, mothered or spanked, and put to bed. Now, at nine, he had acquired health, with a sturdy ability to look out for himself, as boys will in a community like that, especially where the family is rather larger than the income, and there is still a younger child to claim a mother's protecting care. So Sam, as they now called him, grew up at nine, and was full of knowledge for his years. Not that he was old in spirit or manner. He was never that, even to his death but he had learned a great number of things, mostly of a kind not acquired at school. They were not always of a pleasant kind. They were likely to be of a kind startling to a boy, even terrifying. 
Once Little Sam, he was still Little Sam then, saw an old man shot down on the main street at noonday. He saw them carry him home, lay him on the bed, and spread on his breast an open family Bible, which looked as heavy as an anvil. He thought if he could only drag that great burden away, the poor old dying man would not breathe so heavily. He saw a young emigrant stabbed with a bowie knife by a drunken comrade, and noted the spirit of lifeblood that followed. He saw two young men try to kill their uncle, one holding him while the other snapped repeatedly an Allen revolver which failed to go off. Then there was the drunken rowdy who proposed to raid the Welshman's house one dark threatening night. He saw that, too. A widow and her one daughter lived there, and the ruffian woke the whole village with his coarse challenges and obscenities. Sam Clemens and a boon companion, John Briggs, went up there to look and listen. The man was at the gate, and the Warren were invisible in the shadow of the dark porch. The boys heard the elder woman's voice warning the man that she had a loaded gun, and that she would kill him if he stayed where he was. He replied with a ribald tirade, and she warned that she would count ten, that if he remained a second longer she would fire. She began slowly and counted up to five, with him laughing and jeering. At six he grew silent, but he did not go. She counted on. Seven? Eight? Nine? The boys watching from the dark roadside felt their hearts stop. There was a long pause, then the final count, followed a second later by a gush of flame. The man dropped, his breast riddled. At the same instant the thunderstorm that had been gathering broke loose. The boys fled wildly, believing that Satan himself had arrived to claim the lost soul. Many such instances happened in a town like that in those days, and there were events incident to slavery. He saw a slave struck down and killed with a piece of slag for a trifling offense. He saw an abolitionist attacked by a mob, and they would have lynched him had not a Methodist minister defended him on a plea that he must be crazy. He did not remember in later years that he had ever seen a slave auction, but he added, I am suspicious that it is because the thing was a commonplace spectacle, and not an uncommon or impressive one. I do vividly remember seeing a dozen black men and women chained together, lying in a group on the pavement, waiting shipment to a southern slave market. They had the saddest faces I ever saw. It is not surprising that a boy would gather a store of human knowledge amid such happenings as these. They were wild, disturbing things. They got into his dreams and made him fearful when he woke in the middle of the night. He did not then regard them as an education. In some vague way he set them down as warnings or punishments designed to give him a taste for a better life. He felt that it was his own conscience that made these things torture him. That was his mother's idea, and he had a high respect for her moral opinions, also for her courage. Among other things, he had seen her one day defy a vicious devil of a Corsican, a common terror in the town, who was chasing his grown daughter with a heavy rope in his hand, declaring he would wear it out on her. Cautious citizens got out of her way, but Jane Clemens opened her door wide to the refugee, and then, instead of rushing in and closing it, spread her arms across it, barring the way. The man swore and threatened her with the rope, but she did not flinch or show any sign of fear. She stood there and shamed him and derided him and defied him until he gave up the rope and slunk off, crestfallen and conquered. Anyone who could do that must have a perfect conscience, Sam thought. In the fearsome darkness he would say his prayers, especially when a thunderstorm was coming, and vow to begin a better life in the morning. He detested Sunday school as much as day school, and once Orion, who was moral and religious, had threatened to drag him there by the collar. 
but as the thunder got louder sam decided that he loved sunday school and would go the next sunday without being invited fortunately there were pleasanter things than these there were picnics sometimes and ferry-boat excursions once there was a great fourth of july celebration at which it was said a real revolutionary soldier was to be present some one had discovered him living alone seven or eight miles in the country but this feature proved a disappointment for when the day came and he was triumphantly brought in he turned out to be a hessian and was allowed to walk home the hills and woods around hannibal where with his playmates he roamed almost at will were never disappointing there was the cave with its marvels there was bear creek where after repeated accidents he had learned to swim it had cost him heavily to learn to swim he had seen two playmates drown also time and again he had himself been dragged ashore more dead than alive once by a slave girl another time by a slave man neil champ of the pavey hotel in the end he had conquered he could swim better than any boy in town of his age it was the river that meant more to him than all the rest its charm was permanent it was the path of adventure the gateway to the world the river with its islands its great slow-moving rafts its marvelous steamboats that were like fairyland its stately current swinging to the sea he would sit by it for hours and dream he would venture out on it in a surreptitiously borrowed boat when he was barely strong enough to lift an oar out of the water he learned to know all its moods and phases he felt its kinship in some occult way he may have known it as his prototype that resistless tide of life with its ever-changing sweep its shifting shores its depths its shadows its gorgeous sunset hues its solemn and tranquil entrance to the sea his hunger for the life aboard the steamers became a passion to be even the humblest employee of one of those floating enchantments would be enough to be an officer would be to enter heaven to be a pilot was to be a god you can hardly imagine what it meant he reflected once to a boy in those days shut in as we were to see those steamboats pass up and down and never to take a trip on them he had reached the mature age of nine when he could endure this no longer one day when the big packet came down and stopped at hannibal he slipped aboard and crept under one of the boats on the upper deck presently the signal bells rang the steamboat backed away and swung into midstream he was really going at last he crept from beneath the boat and sat looking out over the water and enjoying the scenery then it began to rain a terrific downpour he crept back under the boat but his legs were outside and one of the crew saw him so he was taken down into the cabin and at the next stop set ashore it was the town of louisiana and there were lampton relatives there who took him home jane clemens declared that his father had got to take him in hand which he did doubtless impressing the adventure on him in the usual way these were all educational things then there was always the farm where entertainment was no longer a matter of girl plays and swings with a colored nurse following about but of manlier sports with his older boy cousins who had a gun and went hunting with the men for squirrels and partridges by day for coons and possums by night sometimes the little boy had followed the hunters all night long and returned with them through the sparkling and fragrant morning fresh hungry and triumphant just in time for breakfast so it is no wonder that at nine he was no longer little sam but sam clemens quite mature and self-dependent with a wide knowledge of men and things and a variety of accomplishments he had even learned to smoke a little out there on the farm and had tried tobacco chewing though that was a failure he had been stung to this effort by a big girl at a school which with his cousin puss he sometimes briefly attended do you use terbacker 
the big girl had asked, meaning, did he chew it? No, he said, abashed at the confession. Ha! she cried to the other scholars. Here's a boy that can't chaw tobacco. Degraded and ashamed, he tried to correct his fault, but it only made him very ill, and he did not try it again. He had also acquired the use of certain strong, expressive words, and used them, sometimes, when his mother was safely distant. He had an impression that she would skin him alive if she heard him swear. His education had doubtful spots in it, but it had provided wisdom. He was not a particularly attractive lad. He was not tall for his years, and his head was somewhat too large for his body. He had a great ruck of light, sandy hair, which he plastered down to keep it from curling, keen blue-gray eyes and rather large features. Still he had a fair, delicate complexion, when it was not blackened by grime or tan, a gentle, winning manner, a smile that, with his slow, measured way of speaking, made him a favorite with his companions. He did not speak much and his mental attainments were not highly regarded. But for some reason, whenever he did speak, every playmate in hearing stopped whatever he was doing and listened. Perhaps it would be a plan for a new game or lark. Perhaps it was something droll. Perhaps it was just a commonplace remark that his peculiar drawl made amusing. Whatever it was, they considered it worth while. His mother always referred to his slow fashion of speaking as Sammy's long talk. Her own speech was still more deliberate, but she seemed not to notice it. Henry, a much handsomer lad, and regarded as far more promising, did not have it. He was a lovable, obedient little fellow whom the mischievous Sam took delight in teasing. For this and other reasons the latter's punishments were frequent enough, perhaps not always deserved. Sometimes he charged his mother with partiality. He would say, Yes, no matter what it is, I am always the one to get punished. And his mother would answer, Well, Sam, if you didn't deserve it for that, you did for something else. Henry Clemens became the Sid of Tom Sawyer, though Henry was in every way a finer character than Sid. His brother Sam always loved him and fought for him oftener than with him. With the death of Benjamin Clemens, Henry and Sam were naturally drawn much closer together, though Sam could seldom resist the temptation of tormenting Henry. A schoolmate, George Butler, he was a nephew of General Butler and afterward fought bravely in the Civil War, had a little blue suit with a leather belt to match, and was the envy of all. Mrs. Clemens finally made Sam and Henry suits of blue cotton velvet, and the next Sunday, after various services were over, the two sauntered about, shedding glory for a time, finally going for a stroll in the woods. They walked along properly enough at first. Then, just ahead, Sam spied the stump of a newly cut tree, and with a wild, whooping impulse took a running leap over it. There were splinters on the stump where the tree had broken away, but he cleared them neatly. Henry wanted to match the performance, but was afraid to try, so Sam dared him. He kept daring him until Henry was goaded to the attempt. He cleared the stump, but the highest splinters caught the slack of his little blue trousers, and the cloth gave way. He escaped injury, but the precious trousers were damaged almost beyond repair. Sam, with a boy's heartlessness, was fairly rolling on the ground with laughter at Henry's appearance. "'Cottontail rabbit!' he shouted. "'Cottontail rabbit!' while Henry, weeping, set out for home by a circuitous and unfrequented road. Let us hope, if there was punishment for this mishap, it fell in the proper locality. These two brothers were of widely different temperament. Henry, even as a little boy, was sturdy, industrious, and dependable. Sam was volatile and elusive, his industry of an erratic kind. Once his father set him to work with a hatchet to remove some plaster. 
he hacked at it for a time well enough then lay down on the floor of the room and threw his hatchet at such areas of the plaster as were not in easy reach henry would have worked steadily at a task like that until the last bit was removed and the room swept clean the home incidents in tom sawyer most of them really happened sam clemens did clod henry for getting him into trouble about the colored thread with which he sewed his shirt when he came home from swimming he did inveigle a lot of boys into whitewashing a fence for him he did give painkiller to peter the cat there was a cholera scare that year and painkiller was regarded as a preventive sam had been ordered to take it liberally and perhaps thought peter too should be safeguarded as for escaping punishment for his misdeeds in the manner described in that book this was a daily matter and the methods adapted themselves to the conditions in the introduction to tom sawyer mark twain confesses to the general truth of the history and to the reality of its characters huck finn was drawn from life he tells us tom sawyer also but not from an individual he is a combination of the characteristics of three boys whom i knew the three boys were himself chiefly and in a lesser degree john briggs and will bowen john briggs was also the original of joe harper in that book as for huck finn his original was tom blankenship neither elaborated nor qualified there were several of the blankenships there was old ben the father who had succeeded general gaines as the town drunkard young ben the eldest son a hard case with certain good traits and tom that is to say huck who was just as he is described in tom sawyer a ruin of rags a river rat an irresponsible bit of human drift kind of heart and possessing that priceless boon absolute unaccountability of conduct to any living soul he could come and go as he chose he never had to work or go to school he could do all things good or bad that the other boys longed to do and were forbidden he represented to them the very embodiment of liberty and his general knowledge of important matters such as fishing hunting trapping and all manner of signs and spells and hoodoos and incantations made him immensely valuable as a companion the fact that his society was prohibited gave it a vastly added charm the blankenships picked up a precarious living fishing and hunting and lived at first in a miserable house of bark under a tree but later moved into quite a pretentious building back of the new clemens home on hill street it was really an old barn of a place poor and ramshackle even then but now more than sixty years later a part of it is still standing the siding of the part that stands is of black walnut which must have been very plentiful in that long ago time old drunken ben blankenship never dreamed that pieces of his house would be carried off as relics because of the literary fame of his son tom a fame founded on irresponsibility and inconsequence orion clemens who was concerned with missionary work about this time undertook to improve the blankenship spiritually sam adopted them outright and took them to his heart he was likely to be there at any hour of the day and he and tom had catcall signals at night which would bring him out on the back single-story roof and down a little arbor and flight of steps to a group of boon companions which besides tom included john briggs the bowen boys will pitts and one or two other congenial spirits they were not vicious boys they were not really bad boys they were only mischievous fun-loving boys thoughtless and rather disregardful of the comforts and the rights of others end of chapter eleven days of education read by john greenman